Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. Okay, let's play a game. You're dead. Congratulations. Let's start your journey to the underworld, shall we? First, let's look at how you died. If you died from old age or natural causes, your soul is drawn from your body from the daemon of death, Thanatos, who's a lovely chap, the son of Nyx, the goddess of night. He would come in the time allotted by the fates to take your wee soul away to Hades. However, if you died in a more violent and cruel way, such as murder or in a battle, your soul will be ripped from your body by the Keras, uh, who may or may not have been evil spirits released by Pandora upon opening the jar. You see, the Keras spent their time lusting for blood and haunted over the battlefields like vultures, and the Olympian gods are often described as standing by their favourite warriors in battle, beating the clawing death spirits away from them. So whichever one ripped your soul from your body, uh, it takes you down to meet Hermes, your personal guide to the underworld, who takes you in manageable groups to go and meet Charon, or Charon, or Haron. It really depends on how you say it. I say Charon, but I think the Greeks would have said Haron, it would have been a silent K sound like night, but I'm going to say Charon because it's easier. And Charon is the ferryman of the underworld, who greets you at the banks of the Acherisian mare. From there, he will ferry your soul in his wee skiff for a, a small fee of a single Oblos coin, which, if you've been given the proper burial, should have been put in your mouth. However, if you can't pay the toll, unfortunately, we have to leave you here to wander the earthly side of the Acheron, haunting the world as a ghost. If you don't know how to get there, don't worry. Hecate will lead you back to the earth and let you get on with your haunting. And you'll have some friends. You know, there are some people who actually refuse to follow Charon and they linger on Earth by choice until they are brought down by force. In very rare circumstances, these ghosts might re-inhabit their corpses as the undead, as we see in King Sisyphos and Philinian, uh, but they're very rare cases. Right, so you povos have fun whilst the rest of us who can afford the fare, you can follow me. So Charon will ferry you across to the gates of Hades, which are guarded by the wee hellhound that you can probably hear in the background, Kerberos. And there we enter the court of Hades, where you'll be greeted by the king and queen of death themselves, the god Hades and Persephone. And you will also meet three dudges of the dead, Minos or Minos, Radamanthus and Akos, and these three will decide your fate and where you're going. There's also actually a fourth judge, Triptolemus, uh, who will actually be the benefit judge for the blessed initiates of the mysteries, but we'll talk about you lot later. Once you received your judgment, you'll be handed over to Erinias, who will either purify you if you've been a good little bean, or drag you down to the dungeon of Tartarus. Now, if you've been a little bit naughty, don't worry too much. You know, you may get the chance to redeem yourself. Maybe. It really depends on how naughty you've been. And those of you who've been super, super, super good, you will be taken to Elysium by the mystery god Lacus. Now, those of you who've gone to Tartarus but have a chance of redemption, you'll be removed from Tartarus after a while, usually a year, and sent back to the Acherusian Mare via the river Cocytos, or by the Pyrethlegethon, I hate that word, where you'll be judged by the souls of those you have wronged. I know, bit awkward. So if you win a favourable verdict by those who you have wronged in your life, then you'll be reincarnated. But if they show you no forgiveness or pity, then back to Tartarus you go to repeat the process. But like I said, that is only if you've been slightly naughty. If you were irredeemably wicked, then I'm afraid you're confined to Tartarin Dungeon for all of eternity. No second chances. Now, this may not be your first time here, and if you have been one of those lucky few that's been reincarnated three times, and each time you've been a good little soul, then you've won the self mud the jackpot, my friend. You've earned yourself a one-way ticket to the Islands of the Blessed to reside with all the heroes of mythology for all eternity. So that was a lot of information, wasn't it? You see, if you watched my last video on Hades, the Lord of the Underworld, 
you would have been a little bit disappointed. There's not much on Hades, the god. However, we have a wealth of resources about the underworld itself, which this video, albeit long, barely touches the surface of. But I'm going to do my best to be as inclusive as possible and give you bites of some really interesting facts. Now, what's important to note here at the beginning of this video is that the Greek underworld has a name, Hades. No, not the god Hades, just Hades. People find this confusing, particularly if you read Plato and you say, well, Plato talks a lot about Hades. No, he's talking a lot about Hades the underworld. Hades is the name of the underworld in the same way we refer to the underworld as hell, a lot of us. So if I use the word Hades in this video, I'm referring to the underworld, not the god. And if I do ever need to refer to the god Hades, I will refer to him as such, the god Hades. So, the house of Hades, Hades, the land of the dead, the underworld, whatever you choose to call it, was a mythological realm refined by the mystery cults and the works of ancient poets. In this video, I'm going to look at the archaeological sites believed to have been the gateways to the underworld, the mystery rites, the differences between how the different mystery cults viewed the underworld, and discuss how the underworld was envisaged by multiple ancient writers, including Plato. Now, as this can potentially be quite a long video, I've actually decided to make a separate video exploring the monsters and figures of the underworld in a greater depth. But I will refer to them on here, but for more detail, I will make a whole other video. So if you're interested, then please make sure you subscribe so you're here when the video comes out. But if you're new here, hi, welcome to my library. My name is Chinsia. And if you're one of my lovely regulars, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. So before we get into the depth of today's video, all about the underworld, there's lots of little timestamps so you can pick which section you want to visit. I'm going to firstly thank today's video sponsor, which is Squarespace. Now, as you know, I've built all my main business websites over the past few years with Squarespace because I love how, you know, intuitive and easy it makes website design and layout. I don't know anything about coding, which is made using other website platforms frustrating to say the least, but with Squarespace, I can simply drag and drop my content where I want it. And if you're a creator like me who wants to expand your revenue stream or business, then Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. Squarespace member area lets you sell your courses or classes to your followers. And Squarespace also has an inbuilt email campaign option where you collect email subscribers and can convert them into loyal customers, all from your website. And the built-in analytics feature gives you insight into who's visiting your site, your traffic sources, the time they spend on the site, most read content, audience geography, and so much more. So if you want to expand your business or just build a beautiful website for your blogging leisure, then go to squarespace.com. And then when you're ready to launch your site, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you, Squarespace, for sponsoring today's video. And now let's get into the depths of the underworld. So the mystery cults. How do the different mystery cults view the underworld? Well, there are three that we need to look at. The Orphics, the Pythagoreans, and the Eleusinians. Now, we did a lot about the Eleusinian mystery cult when I covered uh, the Demeter video at the beginning of the first part of the Demeter Persephone Hades video series. And because there's actually a lot to cover in the cults, I would actually like to do a specific video on the cults themselves, more specifically the Orphic cult, because there's so much interesting stuff out there. But let's talk about briefly how they imagined the underworld. So the Orphics, due to the influence of the ancient Egyptian cult of the dead, believed Dionysus or Dionysus was the original god of the underworld, not the god Hades. The Orphics believed in metempsychosis, reincarnation, and the idea of the original sin, and were almost monotheistic in their strong leaning for Dionysus or Dionysus. I don't know which one I prefer to say, I think I prefer Dionysus. Anyway. The Pythagoreans also believed in reincarnation, a form of purgatory, and two different realms of the afterlife, Elysian or Elysium and Tartarus. And we will see philosophers such as, you know, Plato and Socrates discuss this in depth. The Orphics believed that souls that had not undertaken the mystic rites of the Orpheus suffered in mud and painful servitude whilst waiting for their reincarnation. 
But those who did take the Orphic rites and followed their practices spent their days in the company of Orpheus and the gods whilst waiting for their rebirth. They ultimately believe that the soul that lived through three cycles adhering to the Orphic practices was released from the cycle of reincarnation. A central tenet of Pythagorean belief system was the transmigration of the soul. And this included the transmigration of human souls into bodies of animals, which is perhaps uh, the reason why Pythagoras was strictly vegetarian and forbid the consumption of any meat for his followers, resulting in his followers becoming actually some of the largest known vegetarians in ancient history. Now, we cannot treat the mystery cults as a singular category, even when, such as the Orphic and the Pythagorean cults, overlap a lot with some of their beliefs about the afterlife. See, the mystery cults are stupidly complex and wonderfully multifaceted, uh, so I hope I'm doing a small amount of justice, um, but I've covered a lot about the Eleusinian mysteries in the Demeter video, as I've already mentioned, um, but for them, the initiation of the Eleusinian cult, um, along with the participation, was what determined one's fate in the afterlife. And this is what distinguishes the Eleusinian cult from the others. You see, the focus of the Eleusinian cult was on the individual, and this could be seen as rather challenging to the theoretical models of the polis religion, which happened to be the Orphic religion. You see, unlike the other cults, the Eleusinian mysteries were open to all, including foreigners and slaves, men and women, etc. The aim of the initiation was for a better fate and happiness in the afterlife, and we see this in ancient writings. For example, Aristophanes' Frogs presents Heracles as presenting the initiates of the underworld to Dionysus, uh, all of whom are dancing and jesting and wandering around the flowery meadows, with men and women clapping hands and singing in choirs. Sophocles also says that thrice happy are those among the mortals who have seen these rites before going to Hades, for they alone have life there, while others have all kind of misery. So, what did the underworld look like? Again, this is very complex. <laughs> Bloody batteries failing already. In Aristophanes' Frogs, uh, the place of the initiates in the underworld is described as the flowery field of Persephone, where the sun and the moon shine, and where the initiates dance and sing. Very familiar. These initiates, he claims, are pure because they led pious lives. According to Plato in the Phaedo, uh, the abode of the philosophers is located at the top of the heaven and is of immeasurable beauty. And they who are there are also pure because they lived wisely. And Cicero identified this platonic place with the Milky Way, which surrounds a zodiac. Now, you're probably thinking, uh, where are all the rivers, the sticks, the ferryman, the monsters? It all sounds so flowery and peaceful. Well, this is what I mean when I say the concept of the underworld is not straightforward in ancient Greece. It's a journey to the underworld, and then it may layers to it, uh, both in mythology and philosophy. So let's start the journey. In the most simplified version of the underworld, there are three levels. Tartarus, Ashfordel Meadows, and Elysium. Tartarus is the region that most of us can easily associate with hell. This is where people were imprisoned and doomed to suffer the worst punishments for eternity. It takes souls nine days to reach the depths of Tartarus, and some say that the distance between Tartarus and Hades was the same as between Earth and Olympus. Tartarus was where the ferocious monsters and criminals were banished, and where the gods imprisoned their rivals after war, as we see with the Titans. The three judges of the underworld, Radamanthus, Acus, and Minos, or Minos, decided who would go to the realm of Hades and who was banished to Tartarus. The Ashfordale Meadows is where the vast majority of deceased souls reside. It was an in-between place for souls who lived a reasonable but not exceptional life. They weren't overly bad, but they weren't overly good. Those in the Ashfordale Meadows drank from the river Lethe or Lethe, meaning that they would forget their previous lives and live in eternal mindlessness. What makes the Ashfordale Meadows a little confusing when reading ancient Greek texts is that in the Odysseys books 11 and 24, they paint this part of Hades as much less flowery than other ancient writers did. In fact, Homer's Ashfordale Meadow is dark, gloomy and a mirthless place. And then finally we have Elysium, where all mortals aspire to reside. 
Elysium is for the most heroic of mankind, and the souls in Elysium spend eternity enjoying the greatest pleasures. Elysium is mentioned for the first time in Book 4 of the Odyssey in a prophecy of Proteus, who foretells to Menelaus that he, as Helen's husband and son-in-law of Zeus, will be translated into Elysion Pedion, a place at the bounds of the earth where snow, rain and storms never exist, and where only the breezes of the Zephyr blow to cool everyone down, despite those living there experiencing a toilless afterlife. You see, Homer regarded Elysium as the abode of those blessed to have divine links. But there's also another layer to that in the underworld. That was Homer's view, but there are others who believe there's actually the blessed was a different place for the divine. I know, lots of layers. Now, as you can hear my little dogs playing in the background, um, let's talk about the rivers of the underworld, a major feature that I'm sure you all know about, aside from the monsters and the deities. The five rivers of the underworld are the Styx, the Lethe, the Acheron, the Phlegethon, and the Cocytus. Each of the five rivers have a unique function in the underworld and how it worked, and were named to reflect an emotion or god associated with death. Ah, that was quite a sad sound. Anyway, he's fine. The most famous of the rivers is the river Styx, the river of hatred. This principal river circled the underworld seven times, separating it from the land of the living, and it flowed out of the great Oceanus River. In Greek, the word Styx means hate or abhor, and it was named after the nymph of the river, a daughter of the titans Oceanus and Tethys. She was said to live at the entrance of Hades in a lofty grotto supported by silver columns. Most of us know the river Styx from the famous role it played in the myth of the great hero Achilles, who was dipped in the river by his mother Thetis, endeavouring to make him immortal. But in doing so, she held him by the heel or the ankle or wherever myths change, but the heel is the most common version, making all of him strong aside from that one weak point. Cerberus, uh, the monstrous dog with multiple heads and the tail of a serpent, waits on the river side of the Styx, where Haron, or Charon, lands with the shades of the departed. Homer called Styx the dread river of Oath. Additionally, Zeus used a golden jug of water from the Styx to settle disputes amongst the gods. If a god swore falsely by the water, he would be deprived of nectar and ambrosia for the rest of the year and banished from the company of the other gods for nine years. Then we have the river Lethe, the river of oblivion and forgetfulness. As we shall hear more about this in Plato's myth of Ur, the river Lethe is where the souls drink to forget their past lives. Lethe is named after Eris's daughter, the goddess of forgetfulness, who watches over the river. And some tomb inscriptions dating to 400 BCE say that the dead could keep their memories by avoiding drinking from the Lethe and instead drinking from the stream flowing from the lake of Nemocene, which is the goddess of memory. Then we have Acheron, the river of woe and misery, which flows from the swampy lake of Acherusia. And in some tellings, this one is the primary river over the river Styx due to Charon's role in the story of the river. In his frogs, Aristophanes has a character, Curse of Villain, saying, and the crag of Acheron dripping with gore can hold you. Plato in the Phaedo described Acheron as the lake to the shores of which the souls of many go when they are dead after waiting an appointed time, which is some a longer and to some a shorter time. They are sent back again to be born as animals. As you can imagine, there are quite a few rivers in the world named Acheron, with the most significant being the one in Thesprotia, but we'll talk more about that river in the final section of this video regarding the archaeology of the underworld. The next river is the one I hate pronouncing the most, the Phlegethon, which was called also the River of Fire, because it is said to travel to the depths of the underworld, where land is filled with the flames of funeral pyres, and, as you can expect, this river leads you to Tartarus. In one version of the Persephone myth, Persephone eats the pomegranate, of her own volition, and she's ratted out to Hades by Ascalaphus, the custodian of Hades' orchard. In some versions of the story, it's actually Demeter who's so furious with Ascalaphus, for some reason she blames him, that her daughter ate the pomegranate seeds, that she 
buries him under a rock that only Hercules or Heracles can then free him from, which he does so later in another myth. But in another version that's more poignant now, Persephone is actually furious with Ascalaphus for ratting her out to the god Hades, so she takes her revenge on him by sprinkling him with the water of the phlegethon, which transforms him into a screech owl. And finally, we have the river Cocytus, the river of wailing, which, yes, is a river of cries and lamentation. And yes, if you've watched Disney's Hercules, this is the river that we see Hades and Charon going across with all the bodies reaching out of it. The river is filled with the souls that Charon refused to ferry over because they hadn't received the proper burial and didn't have the fees to pay. According to Homer's Odyssey, Cocytus, uh, whose name meant River of Lamentation, is one of the rivers that flow into Acheron and starts a branch of the Styx. In his geography, Pausanias theorises that Homer saw a bunch of ugly rivers in Thesprotia, including Cocytus, and a most unlovely stream, and thought this area was so miserable that he named the rivers of Hades after them. So, now let's talk about Plato's <coughs> Underworld. Ah! Thank you. So, when we want to talk about Hades, what on earth happened there? Why did my light go out? It's plugged in, is it not? I'm having a right palaver with the tech today. The gods of the underworld are clearly not happy with me. So, let's look at Plato's underworld. Now, if you want to talk about Hades, one of the most fascinating sources to look at is Plato. Plato described the underworld as a place of judgment and punishment, where the souls of the dead were sent to be judged by the gods. Plato described the underworld in many of his works, including the Gorgias, the Phaedo, and the Republic. In his works, Plato describes the underworld as a dark and dismal place where the souls of the dead are judged and sentenced according to their life's deeds. The souls of the righteous are rewarded with eternal happiness and peace, whilst the souls of the wicked are punished with eternal suffering and torment. Employing the motif of the hero's descent into the underworld, the Catabasis, the platonic odyssey of the souls of the underworld entails a quest for knowledge on a deeper spiritual level. So, the most famous of Plato's stories about the underworld is the myth of Ur, which I have covered in other videos, but let's go over it here together, shall we? So, according to the myth of Ur, who's an Armenian soldier mortally wounded in battle, he comes back to life 12 days later, moments before his body is cremated on a funeral pyre. I know, terrifying. He describes his posthumous experience to those around him, explaining how the souls travelled with other souls to a divine place where there were two openings in the earth and two in the heaven. Between the openings were the judges of the souls, who sent the righteous to the right in one of the heavenly openings and the unjust to the left in one of the earthly openings. The judges chose Ur, to be a messenger, allowing him instead, rather than going through one of these little portals, to just witness what happened in the afterlife and return to humanity to detail everything he saw. So Ur explained that from the sky exit, souls then appeared clean when they came out, telling of marvellous places that made them feel wonderful. However, the souls that emerged from the Earth's exit were dirty, and they spoke about the misery and difficulties that they faced for a thousand years of punishment for their lifetime sins. But these weren't the worst of the worst, as the souls of murderers and other criminals, such as Arideos, a tyrant of Pamphylia, who had been killed his father and brother, were not allowed to exit the Earth, and they remained trapped in Tartarus forever in torture. So for the souls that were freed after a thousand years, uh, they got to choose a lot that would assign them to a new life, and their choice demonstrated the lessons that they'd learned during their thousand years. After making their choices, the souls drank the water from the lake of forgetfulness and were reborn, forgetting everything about their past life. After seven days, the souls were led to the spindle of necessity, or Ananki. Ananki was a personification of fate in this circumstance. Here the souls were given a number by lottery, and when called, they were asked what their next life should be. The first soul, actually having travelled through the sky in the previous part, chose to become a dictator. However, what he could never have predicted was that his choice would lead him to eat his own children because of his actions as a dictator. Ur realised that the souls that had travelled through the sky and had not lived through punishment, like the others of the path, often chose 
bad things for their next lives, whereas the opposite happened for souls who would experience punishment. So after choosing their next life, they were led under the throne of necessity to the river Lethe, and that's where they were told to drink and forget their previous lives, and then that night, when each soul fell asleep, they were sent to new bodies to lead out their lives on Earth. A little bit like that scene from Soul, when they all shoot down. I don't think it was like that in, you know, Socrates' head, but you know, I, I see it that way. So, obviously, uh, Sol didn't take part in any of this, so when he woke up, he did so in his old body and remembered everything. Now, the myth was used by Socrates to show that the choices that people make impact their experience in the afterlife, and that those who pretend to be pious but are false with their souls will eventually be punished in the next life. Now, unlike the underworld in the Homeric epics, Plato's Hades is not something that really should have been seen by the eyes. It was all meant to take place in the mind. The journey to Hades was an introspective analysis of one's soul, where man's only weapon was reason, and he had to tackle the epic journey of overcoming emotion and choose the path of logic, where the person would gain self-awareness, learn to control one's emotions, overcome fear, and choose to live ethically. Plato's Hades was not a realm of the dead that existed somewhere in the universe. It was a realm that existed within each person, and each soul played its part in uplifting the entire cosmos through the successive reincarnations in the material world. Yes. 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 How long is this going to go on for? Yes. Yes. You look very cute. <laughs> You're welcome. Can I finish the video? Do you mind? I'm in the last section. Thank you. Very kind. So, the gateways to the underworld. To finish this, let's talk about the archaeological sites associated with the underworld. The most common one is a Necromantion, which features in Homer's Odyssey and Herodotus' histories. The Necromantion was an ancient Greek temple of necromancy devoted to the god Hades and goddess Stephanie. Although other ancient temples, such as the Temple of Poseidon in Teneron and those of Argolis, Cumae and Heraclea in Pontos are also known to have housed oracles of the dead, the Necromantion of Ephyra was the most important, as it belonged to the Thesprotians, the local Epirot Greek tribe. Now, according to tradition, it was located on the banks of the Acheron River in Epirus, near the ancient city of Ephyra. The word necromantion means oracle of death, and the faithful came here to talk to their late ancestors. Odysseus enters the underworld via the necromantion to seek out Tiresias, the blind seer. In the histories, Herodotus tells us a story about Ariander, the Corinthian tyrant. According to the story, the tyrant wished to communicate with the spirit of his recently deceased wife, Melissa, to find out where she had hidden a certain amount of money. When Periander's representatives consulted her, the spirit of Melissa refuses to reveal the location of the hidden money, because she was cold in Hades as a result of not having clothes burned for her when she died. To prove her identity, she mentions something only Periander knows, i.e., quote, that he put his loaves in a cold oven. This cryptic message actually meant that the tyrant had had sexual intercourse with the corpse of his wife, something that only Periander would have known. The second Periander heard this, he immediately stripped the clothing off the local woman and burnt the clothing as an offering to Melissa. Ritual use of the mech... Ritual use of the Necromantion involved ceremonies where celebrants seeking to speak to the dead would start by gathering in the temple and consuming a meal of broad beans, pork, barley bread, oysters, and a narcotic compound. <laughs> Following a cleansing ceremony and the sacrifice of sheep, a faithful would descend through the Chthonic series of meandric corridors, leaving offerings as they pass through several iron gates. The necromantia would pose a series of questions or chant prayers, and the celebrants would then witness the priests arise from the floor and begin to fly about the temple through the use of Eremina-like theatrical cranes. 
It's hilarious. The ancient fountain of Lake Aherusia, where the river Acheron was meeting the river Kikotos, was the point of the dead taking the route to Hades. It's also interesting to note that the Acheron River was what gave the Titans their strength as they drank from it through the ten years of the Titanomachy, which was why Zeus cursed the Acheron River, turning it black and bitter. The necromancy was functioning for two centuries until 167 BCE when it was looted and destroyed by the Romans. You can go and see the Necromantion today, but it's important to stress that the site of the Necromantion is still debated among scholars. You know, some believe it's the Necromantion, but more recent scholars um, believe that it's actually just an ancient farmhouse, which really doesn't sell well to tourists taking a trip there, but... If you want a more concrete gateway to the underworld, then we have an alternative archaeological site for you to visit in, do you mind not knocking my little camera over, in Hieropolis, Pamukkale, Turkey. There, Italian archaeologists, led by Francesco D'Andrea, uncovered the entrance to a cave uh, with an engraved dedication to Pluto, the god Hades, above the entrance. The ancient Greek geographer Strabo, who recorded tales of his travels in Asia Minor for the final years of the BCE, mentions uh, the singular properties of a Plutonian, saying, It is an opening of sufficient size to omit a man, but there is a descent to a great depth. The space is filled with a cloudy and dark vapour so dense that the bottom can scarcely be discerned. Animals which enter die instantly. Even bulls, when brought within it, fall down and are taken out dead. We have ourselves thrown in sparrows, which immediately fell down lifeless. The eunuch priests of Pluto would prove their power by entering the gassy cleft and coming out alive, presumably by holding their breath uh, or taking advantage of known pockets of safe air within the cave, whilst birds that flew too close to it often were felled by the poison. During modern archaeological excavations, dead birds on the site helped convince the archaeological team that they'd found the Plutonian's actual gate to hell. The Plutonian temple, as shown in this 3D virtual reconstruction, consisted of a stone doorway that led to a cave-like grotto. Research in 2018 revealed that a fissure in the Earth's surface deep beneath the cave emitted carbon dioxide at deadly levels. And this isn't the only site to have been exposed to potentially deadly fumes coming from the Earth's fissures, as ancient literature has suggested that the Palace of Apollo in Delphi, Greece, or Delphi, Greece, uh, saw people entering into a trance after inhaling toxic fumes at the site, which are now likely known to be a mixture of carbon dioxide and methane. So yes, that was an extensive discussion on the underworld and what we know about it. Some of what we know about it, there is a lot. I will do another video on the monsters, but I think I'm gonna take a wee break from the underworld right now. I've done a lot about Hades and Persephone and the god Hades. So I think I'm going to do a little break and talk about the devil in the next video. Uh, I've had over 50 requests for videos using my form. Uh, so thank you to everyone who uses my Google form to do a video request. I am. I'm loving it. I am so appreciative. I have so many video ideas and some of them aren't long enough. So I think I'll do some shorts, um, but obviously I can dedicate them to you as a thank you or not. So thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video again. And thank you to all of my Patreons. I put them on the screen. And thank you to my top tier Patreons who are Jeffrey Starbin, Arch Capitalist, Robbie Groves, Nicholas Reed, and Andrea Basil. Thank you so, or Basil, Basil. Thank you so, so much for all of your support. I really appreciate your continued support over on Patreon. I cannot thank you all enough, uh, particularly my top tiers. So thank you. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a like and consider subscribing if you're new. And until next time, I will see you for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.